Hey everybody, uh, today I am trying out a little lapel mic, so please let me know if the audio quality is better. It's just a simple, not very expensive mic from Amazon, but want to see if it helps increase the audio uh, quality of the video. So please let me know in the, the comments below. Today we're going to be continuing in Genesis 32, and we're, we're finally getting to Jacob's redemption, redemption where he wrestles with Christ. And it, it's amazing. This story is, is what I've been looking forward to because this is the major turning event in Jacob's life. His name is going to end up changed. We're going to really dig into that more tomorrow, though, more so then than today. And we're going to see Jacob's nature change as we go on throughout the rest of Genesis. He's going to be more humble and, and wiser and, and um more devoted to following the Lord. He, is, he really undergoes transformation of character and life. Today, though, if you got your Bibles, please open up with me. We are going to be in Genesis chapter 32, and uh, we are going to take a look today at verses 22 through 26. Verses 22 through 26. The same night, he arose and took his two wives his two female servants and his eleven children and crossed the ford Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint. He wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now what happens here is Jacob is literally wrestling with Christ. The man he's wrestling with is a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus Christ coming. And he is undergoing this theophany. He's struggling with Christ. He's wrestling with Christ. But before we get there, let's walk through verse by verse. Verse 22. The same night, the same night that he had sent out his servants with the different gifts and the bribes to go give gifts to Esau, he had also divided the rest of his possessions and his servants in two camps so they could be staggered and hopefully one would be able to escape the wrath of Esau and Esau's 400 men that were coming. Jacob also then... He arises that same night, he takes his two wives and the two female, female servants, his two concubines, his eleven children, and they cross the ford Jabbok. And he, send, he takes them and he sends his family, his children, his two wives, his concubines, across the Jabbok. He sends them across the stream and everything else he has. And Jacob is left alone. He is going to be struggling with Christ alone. Now, this is a very important part. I don't want to um, spiritualize what Jacob is going through. You have to be careful when you, when you look at the Old Testament or any part of Scripture and quote-unquote spiritualize it. But I think it's very telling. Jacob was alone when he is going to have this wrestling with Christ. Prior to this, Jacob has been around his family. They're bickering. He's been around the tension with his father-in-law, who is his employer. He's fled. He's been around the sheep. Now all of his possessions, everything is gone. Everything he has is sent across. He is alone on one side by himself. The last time we saw Jacob like this, he was going toward Laban, fleeing from Esau then, journeying toward Haran to be with Laban. And that is when he had the dream, the vision of the stairway to heaven with angels descending and ascending upon it. Now he's alone again. And he's going to wrestle with Christ wrestle with God. The struggle that's been going on in his life, his constant nature of being deceptive and trying to gain things for himself, gaining his own wages from Laban. His struggle to, to pay the dowry of his wives by exchanging his labor. All that he has been struggling for his entire life, struggling to get the birthright, to become the heir instead of his brother Esau. All the things that he has been undergoing are now finding their culmination today at this moment in his life. Now something I found very interesting as I was 
uh, doing a little bit of study this morning before I went to work, the uh, the word Jabok, the this Jabok River, this Jabok stream, it is the intersection of some different wadis, and it literally means in Hebrew to empty itself. Now, words in Scripture mean something. Names and places, they have a meaning tied to them. They're, they're not just random. God has given them that for a reason. They have a names for a purpose. And this word, Jabok, the Jabok River in Hebrew, means to empty itself. To empty itself. Jacob is undergoing an emptying time in his spiritual life. He's had all of his confidence stripped away. He's been crying out to God in desperation. All of his self-confidence and his pride, all the deception he has used for the sake of trying to better himself and better his family, all of that confidence is being stripped away. It's being left bare. He's finding himself literally emptied. And it's in context of this that everything begins to take place. And in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now we find out that this man he's wrestling with is literally Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taking on uh, angelic form, the form of a man, in order to come and have a time of talking with Jacob. And Jacob is struggling with him. And, and yes, this is a literal thing that takes place. He is literally wrestling with Christ until day, fighting and struggling. But spiritually, this is also the turmoil that's been going on in Jacob's life for over 20 years. You could argue, from what we've seen in Scripture so far, he has been struggling with God his entire life, resisting God's sovereignty, treating God at arm's length. Oh, you're the God of my father. You know, you're the God of the fear of Isaac, the God of Abraham. If you bless me, God, then I'll then I'll honor you and give a tithe. He's always treated God at arm's length up until he cried out in desperation and prayer in the beginning of chapter 32. He's afraid for his life, afraid for his family, afraid for everything that, that has happened to him over the last 20 years. It has uh, been a blessing despite and in spite of all of his deception that he has been living out. And now the culmination of that struggle with God takes place and Jacob is going to be broken. Verse 25, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now we're going to dive into this more in the end of chapter 32 tomorrow. I'm going to save that for tomorrow because I think we need to break this section of scripture apart into two Two, uh, two videos together because there's so much here we would, I think, miss the, the impact if we, um, if we try to tie the two major lessons in one time. So we're going to end in verse 26. But what I just read in verse 25, Jacob is wrestling with Christ and there's this constant wrestle and there's, there's no one prevailing. Now, this does not mean that Jesus' strength is somehow deficient. That, that's not what it's pointing to. What it's pointing to is that Jacob's struggle is going to continue until he is broken by God, until he is in one sense, quote-unquote, spiritually disabled. His confidence, his pride in himself has to be broken. And so what God does, what Christ does, is he he touches Jacob's socket. He he hits it to wrestling. And Jacob's hip is put out of joint. He has an injury that is going to be with him the rest of his life. He'll feel it. And he'll be reminded of when his struggle he's had with God and how God has had to break him in order to show him his need for humility and his need for God. I'm going to hit on uh, some psalms for that particular part in just a minute. We're going to see why God values brokenness. Brokenness is not a bad thing in the right context. And we're going to discuss that in a minute. But let's finish off our section today, verse 26. Then he said, that's Jacob says, after his hip's been put out of of joint, the, the man is saying, Christ, he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He continues to struggle with God, desiring blessing. He struggled with Esau. He struggled with his brother back in the beginning when we saw Jacob come on the scene in Genesis, struggling with him to get the rights to have the inheritance and to be the heir. He's struggling for a blessing. He's struggling to have the foremost place, to be honored, to be up here. 
And even with his struggle with God, he is struggling in that sense. Even though he has been physically broken, spiritually impact has not quite taken effect yet. And I want to let that sink in as our major point today. In our lives, there have probably been seasons, even if you are a follower of Christ, where you have been struggling against God. You've been trying to do things on your own or your own way. And you've been being called by God, being convicted to obey Him, but you've been resisting. Or perhaps today you're watching this and you are not a believer. You've never surrendered your life to Christ. You don't believe that you need forgiveness for your sins. And you're continuing to do things in your own strength. You may even resist the, the idea, the notion that there is a God out there that's all-powerful, that is in control of the universe, and that sent His only Son to die for your sin. You may not even believe that sin is real. But can I tell you something that's the truth? Your struggle in this life, in this physical life that we live, is against a holy God. The lack of fulfillment, the desire for something more, the desire for your life to matter and mean something comes from God. The, the fact that you can never find fulfillment in other people, you can never find complete fulfillment in your career no matter how much you love it, no matter how much good you do for society, is because there is a God-shaped hole in your heart, in your soul, that only Christ can fill. Jacob is in that same place. He's grown up with the testimony of his grandfather Abraham and hearing the stories of him, seeing the, the faith of his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, who were godly people who walked with the Lord. He's seen that. He's seen the effects of, of paganism as his brother married these pagan wives that were a thorn in his parents' side. And his parents told him, hey, you need to go to your uncle. You need to marry somebody that you know is from our family, somebody that's more like-minded. Do not marry one of these pagan women like your brother has. We don't even want to live because of how much turmoil and struggle there is in our family, the tension because of that marriage. That's what it said earlier on in Genesis. This struggle was present in Jacob's life. He struggled in order to get his wife. He didn't get the wife he wanted, so he got another one. He wanted the wife of his dreams, the quote-unquote pretty wife who had a very distasteful, well, a very selfish and ugly character. Rebecca, whom he wanted to marry, and he did marry, is a viper at heart. We've seen that. We've seen her selfishness all throughout the scripture. Leah, that, that in God's sovereignty, he married. Instead of, in the place of her sister Rachel, she had a much more quiet and gentle spirit. She had a, she, she had a much better character. We've seen Jacob struggle with his uncle, struggle in his career to manipulatively take from his employer and selectively breed the best of the flock, which was the agreement for his wages. He, he selectively bred the flocks of the sheep in order to get the strongest, best for himself. All this struggle has been going on. And Jacob has not been broken. He's done things in his own strength. He's complained. He's been in angst. He's been angry. He's lashed out irately against his father-in-law, his uncle. He's fled. He's, he's done so many deceptive things. And now his struggle was not just with people. The struggle he had with people was really just an outward manifestation of what inwardly was going on in his heart. It was, it was just the fruit. It was not the root of what was wrong with him. What was wrong with him is he was not reconciled to God. This struggle and this barrier was between him and God. He's wrestling with God. And now it culminates in a, a physical, literal thing where he's wrestling with God incarnate, God in the flesh. And the Lord breaks him. Physically, he dislocates Jacob's hip. If you have your Bibles and you're in a place where you're able to, please flip over to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. There's two psalms that I want to look at today. The first one is in Psalm 34. Psalm chapter 34, verse 18. And it says this, 
The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. When we get to rock bottom, many times that's the best place we can ever be because we finally had enough. We finally spent all of our own resources, all of our own efforts, all of our own um, all of our own uh, struggling to achieve what we want, to try to fulfill the longings of our heart. We've done everything we can and we found out that it's wanting. And we're finally in the place where we are open to obeying God. We are finally brought low to the place of understanding our pride was a facade. Our pride was an illusion. You see, in all honesty, control is an illusion. You and I cannot really control anything. There are circumstances outside of our control. The only one that is in complete control is God. And we understand that when we get to a place of brokenness. For some, that place of brokenness is a divorce that takes place in their life. For some, it is the death of a loved one. For some, it is the, the devastation of a career. For some, it is a huge breaking point. They, they um, err morally or they, they do something that may end them up in jail. There's something of their own volition that has caused great shame and, and continual consequences for the rest of their lives. For some, it's an emotional brokenness. They come to the place where they're at the end of themselves. But however God in His sovereignty weaves this plan out, because He does have a plan for His glory, God brings us to brokenness. And we have the precious promise that God is near to the brokenhearted. We, we sense God's presence much more and much, much more clearly when we are at that place of brokenness. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Over in Psalm 51, a few chapters ahead. Psalm 51, verse 17. David penned this psalm following the, the time when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. The child that was conceived in that adultery ended up dying shortly after the child was born. David not only had all that happen, he murdered the husband of this woman whom he committed adultery with, and then he took her as his wife right after he killed her husband. So much sin going on. Here's this guy that was the worship leader of Israel, the guy who slayed Goliath, the guy who was such a mighty warrior, the women of, of the country sung his praises. David is slain his tens of thousands. The mighty warrior, the shepherd king, the ruggedly handsome king that had literally come up from the bootstraps. A, a poor shepherd became king. And he did all of that in his life. And then he writes this psalm. It's a powerful psalm. There's a lot of lessons here. He gets to a place of brokenness. Here's what verse 17 of chapter 51 says. The sacrifices of God, okay, the sacrifices that God delights in, the sacrifices God accepts. Verse 16, I, I better back up, says that, For you will not delight, God will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. God does not want you to sacrifice an animal. What it says over in Hebrews is those things, the, the sacrifices the Jewish people did for thousands of years, they simply were a picture, a foreshadowing of Christ's coming. Christ did have to die a bloody death upon the cross in order to be the substitutionary atonement for our sins. He died in our place. He atoned for our sins. He paid the debt that we owe. But the sacrifices the Jewish people did never could cleanse sin. They never really forgave anybody. The book of Hebrews tells us that. They were a picture, a foreshadowing of Christ's coming. God does not delight in those things. He gave them as a picture for the seriousness of sin. That this requires blood. This requires life. Spilled. That's the gravity of which our sin has before a holy God. God is a good God. God is a loving God. But He is holy. Unrighteousness, imperfection cannot stand in His presence. That's why He had to send Himself, send His Son, to step out of the glory of heaven, to take on human form and to die a death in our place to pay the debt we could not pay so we can have life with him God's not pleased with the death of animals 
Verse 17, the sacrifices of God, the sacrifices God accepts are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Contriteness, humility. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God is after humility in our lives. He's not after pride. God is going to break. Scripture says He will resist pride. He will put the proud person down. He will humble them. That's what has been occurring in Jacob's life, and it's what will occur in our lives too when we're struggling with God in our pride. God will bring us to a place of humility so that we can be blessed by Him, so He can use us for His glory, so that we can have His good in our lives. In Romans 8.28, I want to draw out one more scripture today. And this is a powerful scripture. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those, verse 29, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, verse 30, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. I know there's a lot of theological terms there, and I'm going to deal with it very briefly here. But Romans 8, 28. We know that those who love God, those who have been called according to his purpose, those who become children of God, that are being called to salvation, for them, God works everything together for good. Now, it does not say that everything is good. It's not a good thing when a Christian dies a bloody death on a cross over in the Middle East today. That still happens. It's not a good thing when some tragedy befalls your family. Those are not good things. But God causes all things to work together for the good of those whom He has called. Those whom have been called to salvation, who are called to be children of God, who are placing their faith in Jesus Christ. God takes all the sin and brokenness of their miry past and He uses it for the glory of God. Paul, who was literally the equivalent of an ISIS agent today, he went out and he was a, a Jewish man, but he went and he was, he literally was like a Muslim jihadist, he went around and killed Christians simply because they were Christians. A religious terrorist is what Paul was before he was Paul, back when he was Saul. Kind of an interesting thing. Saul means proud one or big. That's what the word means. Or, and pride. But you know what Paul means? Humble, little one. God humbled Paul. God brought him to salvation through Jesus Christ. And then the Lord used Paul's past, being a religious terrorist, and he worked it all together for the glory of God. And the testimony, the power of his testimony is he preached the gospel. Imagine that today. Imagine if the most well-known religious terrorist in the world surrendered their life to Christ and became an evangelist for the gospel. What an incredible, powerful testimony they would have. That's what happened with Paul. That's what this verse is talking about. God can take whatever our past, and He can work it together according to His purpose and for His glory. Verse 29, those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. God foreknows those who will be saved. From the foundation of the world, God had a plan in place to send Jesus Christ to save those who would believe in Him. Romans chapter 9, the very next chapter here, and where we are in context, speaks of God's sovereignty in choosing people. But Romans chapter 10 then shows the other side of the same coin, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, anyone, everyone, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The mystery of salvation is something we do not fully understand. God in His sovereignty saves people from their sin and he he knows this and yet he has he sovereignly knows this and he sovereignly has willed this and yet at the same time he calls each and every person to personal surrender personal choice freely to surrender their lives to Christ it's two sides of the same coin it's not two opposing views they're in conjunction not 
in contradiction. Those whom he foreknows, he predestines them. What does he predestine them to? It doesn't say he predestines them to salvation. Those whom he has foreknown will be saved according to his will because God has a sovereign plan that encompasses all of his will. Those whom he foreknew, he predestines to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. He has predestined us who believe in him to grow in spiritual maturity, to, be, to become more like Christ. That is what predestination is speaking of here. Verse 30, And those whom He predestined, He also called. What does it mean? Those who God is predestining that would be saved, foreknown that they would be saved, predestined them to be sanctified, conformed, growing more and more like Christ in their life, more and more patient, more and more kind, more and more self-controlled, less hypocritical, less judgmental. Those he that he has predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, he calls. He issues the call of salvation that they would hear the gospel and believe, Romans chapter 10. And those whom he calls in Christ to salvation, he justifies. When we place our faith in Christ at that very instant, it is just as if we never sinned. We are justified with Christ. It's like we're staying in a courtroom. And the judge gets a paper that says their debt has been paid in full. Their crime has been paid for. Somebody else went to the executioner's chamber and took the capital punishment in their place that they deserve. That's what it means. That he's justified us. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. One day we will be glorified. Right now, we have been justified we or our believers have been justified from our sin. One day, we are being sanctified from our sin right now. We are justified from the penalty of our sin. We no longer have to pay that penalty. We will spend eternity with Christ now. Christ has paid it. We are being sanctified from our sin right now, being freed from sin's power, no longer under bondage and enslavement to Satan and the world and the flesh of the devil. There's still a struggle there, but we're no longer in bondage. We are now under the Lordship of Christ. And one day we will be glorified. Our salvation will be made complete and perfect. Our faith will become sight. We will be freed from the very presence of sin. We no longer will have temptation or struggle because we will be in God's very presence for all of eternity. What a glorious truth it is. Today I want to ask that you would join me in prayer. Father, we've looked at this study. We've, we've looked at Jacob's life and we'll look at more, his redemption next week. But, but today we're zeroing in on the struggle. Lord, that struggle that went on in Jacob's life, that struggle that goes on in so many lives of us who are watching, who can testify of it in our past. And probably, Lord, also people right now who are going through that struggle in their life, a struggle in their own pride to do things their way, to fulfill that longing deep down they have inside. But their marriage can't do it, their career can't do it, the good things they do for society and for the good of mankind cannot fulfill that void. Father, we cannot save ourselves, we can't be good enough. But you sent your Son. And as we wrestle and we struggle in our pride, O oh God, just like Jacob, you break us. You cause that brokenness so that we will be humbled. You break our pride. You resist our pride so that we will be humbled and be open, Lord, and be usable, be teachable. And also, Lord, so that we will be able to be used by you. People don't want to listen to somebody that's taken them a message of Jesus but is a proud, arrogant, crazy person, a hypocrite. But Father, when a humble Religious terrorists like Paul has been humbled and brought to the gospel. His testimony is true and living and the power of the gospel is seen in Christ in the transformation that has taken place in our life. Oh Lord, I pray that we learn that lesson from Jacob. I thank you, Lord, and praise you for today. I ask that you would work, Holy Spirit, in our lives. And Father, somebody today may be watching. They may be angry at the things that were said. Father, I can make people mad. I can. I'm a person and I'm sinful, saved only by the grace of Jesus Christ. But Father, I cannot convict people. And anybody experiencing conviction right now, that is a mark of the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart. Things that are said today that you cannot get out of your mind, it's not because Ryan's some great speaker. I am a very foolish, 
speaker. Through the foolishness of preaching, God delights to save people. But the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance the words of Christ. He will not let you go. He convicts us about righteousness, how we need to live rightly, about the coming judgment, and about the reality of sin. And He always exalts Jesus. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit will do that today. In Jesus' name I ask these things. And ask that you will bless us as we see the redemption of Jacob tomorrow. Lord willing. Amen.